Hey everybody, today I have flown down to Southern California to take a more detailed in-person look at the upcoming Kia EV9. This is not going to be the first three-row SUV that's electric in North America. We actually have three solid options currently on sale right now in the Tesla Model X, the Rivian R1S, and Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV. But you can bet that even though we don't know pricing yet, this is going to be significantly less expensive than all three of those options. And it's entering a space that is so far unoccupied by mainstream car companies. We are going to see an ID Buzz coming soon. We're going to see a Volvo EX90 in the luxury segment that's going to be about $80,000. We, of course, have the VinFast VF9, which hasn't received terrific reviews. It's also about $80,000. And then we see the sister ship to this from Hyundai eventually, the Ionic 7. So let's take a look at the EV9 see how this fits in the landscape and talk about why you definitely should put this on your shopping list if you're taking a look at a Kia Telluride. First, let's talk about the look. Kia has definitely opted for a very boxy and very upright design. This very blue model right here is the GT line trim. This is gonna be the top end version of the EV9 and it's gonna receive some distinctive changes to the front end design versus the lower and mid-level trims. The most prominent of which is this digital multi-pixel design going on here in the digital tiger nose grille, which is what they're calling this area. And then this narrow area down here where we find not one, but two LiDAR sensors that are optionally available available on the GT line. This is going to give you hands-free driving on select roadways in North America. Some of the details are still left to be decided, but it's also going to expand the functionality of the autonomous braking and active safety systems on the vehicle. Then we have some very distinctive daytime running lights here, turn signals as well, and these multi-pixel LEDs. Those elements are standard across the line. But we now know that those elements aren't exactly the same. So over here in the land trim, we get multi-module pixel style headlights, but they're more horizontal than vertical like we see in the GT line. Much like the EV6, the lower portion of the bumper also changes a bit between the two different trims to help keep things fresh. But both models are gonna give us active shutters to help improve the aerodynamics of the EV9. Going in for a closer look at the headlights, you'll notice that in the land trim, we have the turn signals as these geometric blocks. The more rectangular LED blocks above and below are the headlights themselves. The arrangement of the modules is opposite what you might expect. The upper module is the low beam, the lower module is the high beam. Moving over to the GT line, you'll notice that the daytime running light strip becomes the turn signal, and the headlights are different as well. The low beams are on the outside, the high beams are on the inside. Speaking of aerodynamics, those numbers are particularly impressive on the EV9. We have a coefficient of drag of 0.28. That's about the same as a Jaguar I-Pace, which you may recall is considerably smaller than this, considerably lower to the ground than this, and definitely more of a sports crossover styled vehicle. This is very boxy and upright, and that's really what's different between this and the only other three row EVs currently on sale in the US, aside from the Rivian R1S, is that we actually have a horizontal roof line back here and a real usable third row. The third row is significantly larger than the one that we see in the Tesla Model Y. That really is an emergency use third row suitable just for small children, maybe your mother-in-law back there. This is the kind of third row you could put actual adults in the rear of. Very much like the Rivian, but logically for a whole lot less money. At just over 197 inches long, this is almost exactly the size of the Kia Telluride, one of the largest three row crossovers in its segment. Now, as I usually caution with coefficient of drag numbers, remember that it's a coefficient. And if you go back to your math classes, this is not an absolute statement of aerodynamic efficiency. Clearly, this is going to be less aerodynamic than a sleek, sexy coupe but that gives you a general idea of how this fares against similarly shaped vehicles in its segment. So you compare this to a Telluride, this to a Rivian R1S, this is going to be a lot more aerodynamic. Aerodynamics are definitely important because obviously the EV9 is gonna be heavier than the Telluride. We don't have exact details, but you can certainly bet on that. And that's part of the reason we have much wider tires than on a Telluride. These are 285-45ZR21s. We're gonna get really wide and really grippy tires on the EV9 because Kia is really focused on motor efficiency and aerodynamic efficiency, allowing you to have those larger tires. Now, we'll talk about range in just a moment, but as you'd expect out of a big boxy SUV, the range figures are not going to be 400 or 500 miles. If you want some of those extreme range EVs, you're gonna be paying for that extra range, and again, a lot more than the EV9's base price. 
Rather unfortunately, I don't have access to a base trim of the EV9, so I can't tell you what that's like, but this land trim is described as a mid-level trim in terms of its feature functionality and equipment, and we still have pretty darn wide tires here. These are Kumo tires, so not quite as expensive as the tire we find in the GT line, but these are still 275 50R20s. We get a reasonable amount of cushions. These are not ultra low profile 20s. Just gives you some idea of how big and boxy the EV9 is. Now let me know what you think of the wheels. These are aero covers, and so this large triangular black section is removable. You'll get more of a standard alloy design, but I have to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of the wheels on either of these EV9s. When you move to the rear, you'll notice that the profile does drop a little bit, but most of that drop is this relatively long aerodynamic spoiler on top of the hatch. The roof line itself is remarkably consistent front to rear. The rear end style reminds me an awful lot of a supersized Nero. That actually seems attractive to me, and I think this wears the general style a little bit better than that hybrid Nero. You'll notice that the taillights have a very similar design theme to the headlights with this accent strip in there that was designed to look like stars and constellations, apparently. I don't quite see it in the design, but I think it's definitely an attractive look. The rear end design of the mid-level trim is very similar. The only major difference is down here at the bottom of the bumper where we find those vertical lines right around the license plate. In addition to the mechanical release like you find in the EV6, the EV9 also offers an electronic release for the hood, giving us access to a relatively small front trunk area. But it doesn't have that separate pizza box style lid like we find in the EV6, certainly making it more practical. The reason, of course, for the small front trunk is that Kia gives us a very short hood profile, really maximizing the interior volume for the exterior space. So the general profile of the EV9 is somewhat similar to the Telluride, except that we actually have a slightly shorter hood profile here. Underneath everything, there are gonna be two different battery packs and four different power levels. The base battery is gonna be a new 76.1 kilowatt hour unit. Kia is calling this the fourth generation of their battery technology, likely the same generation as the new Hyundai Ioniq 5N, but we don't have exact details from the global conglomerate about that detail just yet. There's also gonna be a larger battery pack if you want more range or more power. That's gonna be rated for 99.8 kilowatt hours. If you get the smaller battery pack, there's just one power level option. Rear wheel drive only, 215 horsepower in the back, 258 pound-feet of torque. That should give you around 220 miles of EPA range, but it's important to know that EPA range numbers have not been finalized just yet. Those should be happening very soon because the EV9 is going on sale calendar year 2023. We'll talk about that more in just a bit. Zero to 60 time in that base rear wheel drive model, 7.7 .7 seconds. You might be surprised by that because this is gonna be relatively heavy and it's just, just 215 horsepower. But remember that electric motors don't deliver power the same way that a gasoline engine does. And that's why this is about as fast as the average three row crossover. If you get the bigger battery pack, you have the choice of three different power levels. The base rear wheel drive model goes down a little bit to 201 horsepower, retains the same 258 pound-feet of torque, and zero to 60 stretches out to 8.8 .8 seconds. That is a little on the slow side for a three-row vehicle, but it will give you 300 miles of EPA range, and I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up beating that number by just a little bit. We've seen that the eGMP platform vehicles have been pretty darn efficient. If you want more oomph, there's the dual motor version that bumps power all the way up to 379 horsepower, 443 pound-feet of torque, good for a 5.7 second zero to 60. That's basically Explorer ST territory. And if you wanna go even further and get the GT line, that's gonna bump the torque up to 516 pound-feet of torque, enabling a five second run zero to 60. Now, interesting twist. If you get the dual motor version of the EV9, you can upgrade to the higher torque output figure at any time via an over the air update. That's gonna bump you from 443 pound-feet to 516. It's also gonna change the power delivery dynamics of the battery pack a little bit to enable that zero to 60 run seven tenths of a second faster. We don't have exact EPA figures just yet, but the all wheel drive model should run between 240 and 250 miles of EPA range. So a reasonable reduction over that more efficient single motor rear wheel drive model. Now to the question that nobody has an answer to. Is Kia going to adopt the Tesla NACS charge connector like Ford and General Motors and a number of other companies have uh, signed on to? We just don't know the answer to that. At the moment, there's not much of a benefit for Kia because they have really pegged their future to the 800 volt charging standard, much like Porsche with the Taycan. That's what enables the really fast DC fast charge speeds that we see here and the ability to maintain those fast charge rates for quite some time. 
when you trade high voltage for high current, there is an overheating concern in some of the components, and that's logically why those lower voltage high current systems have a really peaky charge curve. The average charge rate on the smaller battery pack here is likely going to be a bit more linear than the charge rates that we see in Tesla's lineup. The reality and the longer answer is that charge adapters are gonna be a way of life for every EV owner on both sides of the spectrum for quite some time. In urban areas, CCS connectors are gonna be a little bit more common. If you want a road trip, the Tesla supercharger network is absolutely hands down the best network to use. It will not, however, charge these terribly quickly using the current Magic Dock adapters. That's a tale for a different time. But it's important to know that Tesla has actually moved to the same signaling charging standards that this Kia uses. So the Tesla charge connector, NACS, is actually gonna be using PLC as far as its communication method. They're not using the proprietary standard in NACS. And the AC level two signaling is exactly the same as J1772 also. So versus what's going on here, really it's just the connector. And that means that Tesla owners are gonna have connectors around so they can connect to charge point stations, older CCS stations, et cetera. And this vehicle will have adapters hanging out so they can charge at NACS level two or perhaps level three stations in the future. As you'd expect out of their flagship, the EV9 will have a ton of driver assistance tech standard. Adaptive cruise control, Kia's highway driving assistant version 2.0 will be standard, autonomous emergency braking, pre-collision warning, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic detection, even a side airbag between the two front seats is gonna be standard on every EV9. Then there's gonna be a ton of optional technology if you want it, including the LiDAR sensors, hands off the wheel driving, the 360 degree camera system, parking sensors all the way around the vehicle as well. If you want the latest in active safety tech, this is basically it, aside from completely automated driving, and we don't know how aggressive Kia's hands-off-the-wheel system is going to be. It might not quite be Cadillac Super Cruise, but it's definitely going to be a step above what we find in every other Kia currently in the U.S. Obviously, it's a little bit difficult to talk about front seat comfort since I haven't been driving this all day, but it's unquestionably the most adjustable seat that Kia has ever produced. We have features like four-way adjustable lumbar support, of course, the reclining mode with the ottoman functionality that we've seen in some other vehicles, most notably the Kia Carnival minivan, but now on the front and second row of seats. We also have an anti-fatigue driver side massage functionality that interestingly we don't find on the passenger seat, but this is not something that you find in the average three row crossover really at any cost. We have a power tilt telescopic steering column, two position memory over there, and of course heated and ventilated seats. Here's a closer look at the controls. We have the four-way lumbar, the inflatable bolsters. This is a quick access button to the recline functionality for the seat. It'll also bring you right back to the original seating position if you press it again, but you can see that it uh, folds out that ottoman right there and gets you to a relaxing position. You can of course get that front seat further rearward, but it reclines to the position that it's in because we have the same functionality back here in the second row seat with that power folding ottoman and the really aggressive recline. Obviously we have that flat floor up front like you'd expect in a modern EV, but the advantage to a dedicated EV platform becomes more obvious the further back you go. Here in the second row, we of course have a flat floor since there's no need for a drive shaft to be running right through there. That allows us not just easier access to the third row, it actually gives us more room for the second row seats. And you'll really notice that in the headroom figures. Not only do we have over 116 inches of combined legroom back here, we have over 39 inches of headroom in the second row and way back there in the third row. Something that I had really honestly not expected is that this second row and this third row are more comfortable than the Kia Telluride, and the Kia Telluride is already one of the more comfortable in the segment. Now, unfortunately, we are not apparently going to be getting the turnaround style captain's chairs that you may see in international market EV9s. We don't know whether those are gonna to come to the US or not in the future, but we do have a very comfortable second row. We gain to have that recline functionality, we get butterfly style headrests, latch anchors for child seats there, and uh, we also get heating and ventilation for the seats. Those are the controls over there. Now, getting into the third row, let's go ahead and give that a try. We have a button right here. This does take a little bit longer than a manual mechanism. Obviously, there are going to be different seat packages in the EV9, so these are not going to be the standard seats. These are gonna be the ones you'll find in the more expensive models. It does take, as you can see, some time to collapse that seat, move it forward for easier access to the third row. And even when that seat is in its most forward position, the opening is a little bit smaller than I had expected. If you opt for the twin power captain's chairs, I suspect the easiest way to get back into the rear is gonna be right here through the middle. And back here, you're gonna find a little bit less leg room than you might find in some of the competition. Of course, I can power this seat forward 
and still very comfortably sit up front at six feet tall in the second row with gobs of legroom left and squeeze myself back here in the third row. But headroom is what is more interesting. Again, over 39 inches of headroom. Look at this back here. I have about two inches of headroom back here. If you want more headroom than this, you're gonna be looking at something like a Grand Wagoneer. Even the average minivan isn't gonna have as much third row room. The other thing you'll notice is that this seat bottom cushion is not slammed all the way to the ground to get that extra headroom back here. So it's certainly gonna be more comfortable for adults. And because we have that completely flat floor, my feet are sitting in the exact same position off the ground as the driver, the front passenger, and as the second row. It's really obvious if you come in for a closer look like this, you can see that we just have one completely flat plane as it goes all the way up there towards the front. That really is something that we don't find in any gasoline vehicles outside of some of the really large body on frame SUVs. Now on the downside, the third row is just a two passenger third row. There is no eight passenger option for the EV9. I kind of wish that Kia had at least attempted to squeeze a teeny tiny little optional seat back there, but they do give us latch anchors for all four rear seating positions. That's a touch that we don't find in too many options. And that's really more valuable here because we get that extra leg room and relatively easy access compared to some three row vehicles. Seriously guys, check out this headroom. Look, my head's all the way back there on that headdress. Just pan around to the side. You can see how much headroom is going on back here. Uh, we also have some controls up here for the map lights in there. That's a nice touch. And of course, air vents back here for the way back as well. And as we see in other Kias, you can rotate this knob around to select between direct and indirect airflow for these air vents in the ceiling. That's a really cool touch. We also see that in the Telluride. Third row folks also get USB charge ports and four cup holders back here for the two passengers. Let's take a look around the interior of the land trim. With the EV9, Kia is really focusing a lot more on sustainability than they have in some of their gasoline models. So we have a high percentage of post-consumer recycled and recyclable and biosourced materials in here, including things like the headliner, the seat materials, certain dashboard components, etc. We find some new controls for the sunroof here. It does have an opening sunroof and a complete shade that closes that off. So if you're worried about an EV9 with just a completely glass ceiling, you might want to take a look at the EV9 because we're certainly going to see that complete glass ceiling in a lot of the other three row EVs out there. Moving to the rear, we find a separate large pane right there. It's not quite as roomy as some, but again, it has a shade that closes that off. We find ceiling air vents, the controls for the separate tri-zone climate control system. The third and second row have their own climate control system. We do have a heat pump in this model. It is standard in the all-wheel drive trims. It is available in the big battery rear-wheel drive model. You can't get it with the small battery. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, two-way adjustable headrests. They have sort of a mesh theme that we're seeing in a number of EVs. We then have uh, imitation leather upholstery here up front, perforated of course because the seats are both heated and ventilated. As we see in other Kia models, we have controls for the front seat back right there on the side so that we rear passengers can move it forward if needed. And then we have a USB-C charge port on both front seat backs. Let's just pan around the interior really quickly before we take a look at the specifics. This gives you an idea of the design, which is definitely a departure from what we've seen in other Kias before. Over on the front doors, we have a decent number of soft touch materials, obviously not quite as many as you'll find in something like the new Volvo EX90, but we do have soft touch upper sections of the doors, those heated and ventilated seat controls right there, fabric insert right inside that door armrest. We have a bottle holder down there at the bottom of the door and even storage integrated inside the grab handle area of that soft touch armrest. Moving over to the dashboard, the premium materials continue with definitely a different design than we've seen in Kias. We have a soft touch upper section of the dashboard, a fabric insert right there in the middle, lots of different ambient lighting variations going on. It's a little bit difficult to show you in the studio. This textured trim panel has the effect of maybe compressed bamboo, something along those lines. It's a really interesting design. We then have some very thin air vents all the way around and a very traditional glove compartment down here. It is a large bin style compartment. You can see that it swings open from the dashboard to give you a little bit more usable room than you'll find in some of the competition, but it's not some sort of strange powered glove compartment or anything like that, and it's right where you expect it to be. I say that because I was recently in the EX30, another EV that really intrigues me that's gonna be on the market soon, but it has a tiny glove box right here in the middle. We also have the same EV software updated from the EV6. So this has a new skin, but a lot of the same basic functionality as that EV6. You can see that we have a redesigned home screen right there. Very similar mapping interface. One of the big changes is we now have this dynamic touch button bank down here. When it's not in use, it turns off. Kia is also giving us some new EV specific screens. We of course have full screen Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. 
One potential issue I noticed today is that I kept wanting to rest my fingers down here on this touch button bank while I was interacting with the system. And of course that means that you're gonna accidentally be taken over to some of the other options that you're not really after if you're not paying it too much attention. Between that and the full LCD instrument cluster, we find the controls for the climate control system integrated there in a touch bank between the two systems. It has kind of a retro vibe that I like. Over here we have that full LCD instrument cluster. Uh, the design of that is obviously different than we find in the EV6, but a lot of the functionality is the same as far as the core functionality goes. We still have our trip computer right there in the middle, and the display is not quite as configurable as I might hope for a system like this. We don't find, for instance, full moving map displays or anything like that there. We do, however, have an all new steering wheel design, Spork grips up top, kind of a flat top, flat bottom look. The shiny trim on the steering wheel does seem to show fingerprints pretty easily. I'll be interested to see how that holds up in real life. We have the controls to that multifunction cluster over here, adaptive cruise control. Down here we have the drive mode selector and the four wheel drive lock button. And then over on the right side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the infotainment system. On the back of the steering wheel, we have shift paddles like we find in the EV6. That's one of the options I really love in the Hyundai and Kia EVs. And then if we look just behind the steering wheel, down there we find the shifter. So this is also where we find the power button. So that's the power button. We rotate around for drive, reverse, and then park is this button right there at the end of the stock. In the middle of the dashboard, we have that power and volume control. We then have temperature controls for the driver and front passenger. Below that, we have some kind of innovative USB ports. Uh, we haven't seen this in too many vehicles before. You'll notice right now it's orange. That's because it's a USB interface for the infotainment system. If I press this button in the middle, it toggles between that mode and a simple USB charge only port. Below that, we find the advantage of that completely flat floor here in this additional storage area down there at the bottom. You can see that hovers just below this large center console area here. We have a roller style cover on the top that opens to reveal two large cup holders. You can remove these dividers if you want to put even larger drinks inside and then press the buttons to have them pop out. You can also close that off if you don't want to have access to that or don't want to see it. Fingerprint sensor there. We have the auto brake hold, 360 degree camera button, hill descent control, etc. Behind that, we have a Qi wireless charging mat and then the center console sort of armrest right there between the driver and front passenger. Under that, you'll notice that we don't have a huge storage area. I'll show you why in just a moment, but this is what the new key looks like. You can see it looks pretty similar to the keys that Kia has used for a while with the buttons on the side, but we get even more buttons if we flip over to the other side. There's a button to open the front trunk, and of course the automated parking buttons right there on the key as well. Also, a button to start the vehicle. Now, this compartment is relatively small under that armrest, Back here, we have two large cup holders for the second row and a lot of storage going on just below that. If I open this up, you can see that we have a large work surface there for the rear seat passengers. You could also sort of use it as a tray table for your takeout. It extends even further, which is why you won't find this on the seven passenger model. It's only available on the six seat model. It then opens up to give us access to that entire storage compartment right there. You could definitely stick an awful lot of stuff in there. So if you're wondering where the extra space for that center console goes, it's split between the front passenger and the driver and the second row passengers. The one area where the Telluride seems to have an advantage over the EV9 is the cargo area, but it's probably a fairly slight advantage. This still seems to be larger than average for a three row crossover. Over here, you can see the onboard 15 amp, 120 volt inverter. We have powered seat buttons here for the second row that actually puts them forward but the third row seats are manual that's actually my preference because you can operate them an awful lot faster than you can a powered seat you just pull on that and drop them forward it's pretty darn easy under here we do have a little bit of extra storage space but it's not a great deal obviously no spare tire because the battery and the electric motor are just under that load floor over there Perhaps the oddest button in here is this one on the cargo side. If we press and hold this button, it allows you to close the hatch from the inside. As you all know, I love hopping into trunks, so that button is near and dear to my heart. It also allows you to escape the hatch from the inside if you want to. Wondering what the ambient lighting looks like? Well, here's a look inside the GT line interior with the ambient lighting active. Sorry for the dinging of the car there. You can see that we have the color sections right there under the infotainment system, right in between that fabric insert. Then of course, in the doors, in the storage console, in the center area, basically all the usual suspects. In the second row, we have illuminated door sections, just like we had in the front. And then we have fairly bright ambient lighting down here for the second row footwell. What about the mother-in-law row? Well, not a lot going on back there. 
Rather unfortunately, one of the most important things that we don't know regarding the EV9 is its price tag. There have been a lot of wild rumors on both sides. Is it going to be more expensive than assumed, less expensive than assumed? We just don't know. If I had to put my own guess on it, I would assume a starting price of around $55,000. Logically, it's going to be more than the EV6. But let me know what your predictions are down there in the comment section. Where do you think the starting price is going to be? And where do you think the price tag is going to end? I would not be surprised if this was by far the most expensive Kia available in North America in the top end trim, which is going to be this EV9 right here. But I would also expect it to top out less than the Volvo EX90. The EX90 is going to be around $80,000 with a very similar battery pack, a little bit more power, but not necessarily more performance. And interestingly enough, I have been inside both of them. This is an awful lot bigger in the back. And that's probably the reason that the EX90 from Volvo is going to give us more electric range. A, it has a bigger battery pack. B, it's more aerodynamic. It's a lot smaller in the rear seat area. It really has a very swoopy profile towards the rear that improves its range, but it also means that it's probably going to be a little bit tighter inside. Another interesting twist, the last EX90 I saw didn't have tires as wide as this EV9. My personal prediction is that this is going to start less expensive than the Volkswagen ID Buzz. It's probably also going to be less expensive than the VinFast VF9. We know that it's probably not possible that it will be as expensive as an EQS SUV, and you could bet it's also going to be a pretty steep discount versus a Tesla Model X or a Rivian R1S. My personal expectation, again, is it's probably going to span from around $55 to maybe about $75 or $80,000, somewhere in that general pricing range. But those details are coming a little bit later this year. And stay tuned, because they should be coming pretty darn close to the time you're watching this video. This is going to be produced this calendar year, and it's going to be on sale in the United States this calendar year. Now, there is a reason that some of you might want to wait to buy one until 2024, however. At the beginning, initial EV9 models will be produced in South Korea. Because of its assembly location, initial EV9 deliveries are not going to qualify for the $7,500 tax credit on purchases. If you lease one, it's likely that Kia will pass that along, but details remain to be seen. However, in 2024, they are going to be moving production to the United States. Kia is investing big bucks in their Georgia factory, and they're going to be building the EV9 there and other future EV models as well. At that point in time, at least some portion of that tax credit will likely return. Things remain to be seen about the full tax credit because it is a multi-tiered system and it relies on sourcing for critical battery components. We don't have all those details just yet, but you can bet that Kia is working pretty hard to get that full tax credit back because that's going to be a major competitive advantage for the EV9. And it's worth noting that's going to be a major competitive advantage in the three row segment as well, because not all three row options have a price tag low enough and assembly point in the right place to get that tax credit on purchases also. So if that's of major importance to you, you want to wait till the second half of 2024 and then make sure you get the VIN that was built in North America. Out of all the EVs that we're going to see in North America over the next 18 months, the three that interest me the most are the EX30 and EX90 from Volvo and this Kia EV9. I like the styling on all three. They're all boxy, upright vehicles. Of course, the EX30 has some political baggage because it's going to be built in China. This and the Volvo are actually going to be built right here in North America. And I'm not just thinking of the Volvo and the EV9 in the same sentence because they're both boxy three-row EVs, but because honestly, Kia has clawed their way up from, let's be honest, kind of a joke in the automotive industry to being a real leader when it comes to technology, efficiency, sustainability, and yes, even design. Also now when it comes to safety technology, because this is actually going to be beating the Volvo EX90 to market with the first LiDAR system available in North America. That's going to offer us expanded active safety functionality, future features that Kia won't talk about just yet, and also, of course, hands off the steering wheel driving capability. Let me know what you think about all that, and is the EV9 on your shopping list, or would you rather have that EX90? I would say it's hard to go wrong with either, but that EX90 is getting a little on the late side. Volvo has actually said that they're pushing back deliveries a little bit further, so this is going to go on sale significantly in advance of that three-row Volvo.